Okay, so um, I want to just get started maybe, I mean, you guys have known each other for a long time, um, from the early days of Lending Club, and uh, so maybe, why don't you, why don't, Sol, why don't you get started by just telling us a little bit about your, your history together? So exactly 10 years as of Monday, because we both wow. received an email from Facebook telling us that we've been friends of Facebook for 10 years. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, <coughs> I've known Renault because of Oracle. Um, Oracle bought his previous uh, company, and he had to stay for two years. I think he was counting the days before he can go back to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I heard a lot about him, and I was always impressed by what he built before and his opinion about how uh, we should create platforms, we should, create, we should deploy technology in really creating a better value for the customers. And finance was, of, was one of the industries that really did not get as much as it could get from, from technology. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we met each other the first time. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> Why don't you add to that, Renaud? Yeah, so I think a, a key moment in our relationship and our, our friendship over the last 10 years was when uh, Seoul uh, left Lending Club uh, to, uh, to found uh, Janwong. And um, we've, it happens sometimes that you lose, I mean, some of the most innovative entrepreneurial people, when the company starts growing, uh, it's not as much, uh, uh, as much fun from some, uh, to, some, to some respect. And, uh, and you start losing some of these people. And, and usually uh, my uh, response is, uh, yeah, let, uh, let, let them experience what they want to do. And, and they'll probably be back in six months because uh, most of the time, <laughs> new ventures just don't work out. Yeah, particularly um, going to China. <laughs> except, uh, except with Seoul, um, there, there's one thing with Seoul is it just like never gives up. Uh, and that's, <laughs> it doesn't matter how much uh, adversity is in front of him. Uh, he, he would never give up. And I think that's um, uh, the most um, um, uh, sort of endearing trait of, uh, of an entrepreneur and uh, one that makes entrepreneurs successful. If you don't stop until you succeed, at some point you're gonna succeed. Right. Um, and so I, I knew uh, Saul was leaving for good. And so instead of just saying, hey, doesn't matter, it'll be back in six months, I decided to invest in general. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right, right. Okay, so let's, let's, let's dig right into it. Um, I wanna start off with you, Saul. I mean, we've, we've, had, we've heard from a couple of presenters today about the the differences between the East and the West. I mean, Max Bork has talked about it in, in some depth. Um, what's your perspective uh, when, if you look at the fintech industry, how, I mean, you're, you've also got experience, uniquely, unique experience in both countries. What, what is different um, between the East and the West when it comes to the fintech, the innovation that's happening in fintech in, uh, in both, both countries? So, really the story of building internet businesses um, in China is the exact story of Amazon versus Alibaba. So I don't think Amazon, uh, the first day they were trying to build the company, they worried how am I gonna ship packages from this city to another or how am I gonna get payment. We have a very strong infrastructure in the US mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure Alibaba had to create a payment company, had to create an escrow company, a logistics company. So you have to invest a lot in building infrastructure. And once you build that infrastructure, you end up with a platform that allows you to build even bigger businesses. Imagine five years ago when we came in uh, to China and we wanted for the first time ever use data to give you credits. Every time we talked to people said, no, we prefer collateral. We're not gonna invest because there is no collateral behind. So we have to create an infrastructure to get data, make sure that the data we get is uh, credible, uh, try to analyze it, try to create a new model of pricing people and, and giving them loans. Because in China before us, there are two options. If you have a house, a car, you will get a, a product from, from the bank. If you don't, then unfortunately you have to pay 50, 60% from shadow banking. So really, I think uh, what uh, is striking is how we are able to create infrastructure in a very short period of time in China that I would say is at the same level today as the one in the US. And it's not only China story, I would say it's an emerging market story. I see a lot of people in Indonesia and in India trying to do the, the exact same things. So that's to me is the main difference. Culture uh, uh, affects things too, but I think the fundamental difference for me is infrastructure versus 
uh, taking a service that we have at this level and bringing it to a higher level. But in China, it did not exist before. We're doing it for the first time. Okay. And so, so Renaud, I want to, um, you know, you, you've obviously now been in, in Silicon Valley. You've been a, you know, a venture-backed uh, firm for, you know, for many years. And you know, Silicon Valley is obviously the, you know, some of the lead, has invested in some of the leading companies on the planet. Um, what, you know, what do you think the West does well that, um, and what do you think that the West, and when I say the West, let's just start, let's just say the United States, you know, can, can learn from, from China and what, what, what some of the things that your soldiers said, what do you think the West can learn? So, <coughs> um, I mean, there, yeah, there's so much. <laughs> uh, but the, um, I think what, what I've been uh, sort of very impressed with, so particularly in FinTech, just to, uh, to narrow down the, the, the scope a little bit, um, they, um, I think payment technologies uh, have uh, evolved a lot faster in, uh, in China than they have uh, in, uh, in, in the US, uh, mostly because of the lack of credit cards. Right? So China has, in a way, sort of leapfrog uh, that, that, that credit cards. Right. And, and the availability of credit cards and the fact that cards work just fine as a, as a payment mechanism in the US has really slowed down the adoption of, of mobile payment, for example. Uh, so the US is really lacking behind in, in mobile. Um, so I think one, one of the areas that's going to be really interesting to watch in the next uh, few years is going to be the combination of um, payment and credit and the intersection of the two. Um, because they, I think the US consumer credit uh, models and infrastructure is probably slightly ahead. Uh, I think the mobile payment infrastructure and, and business models are clearly ahead in China. Um, it's going to be interesting to see um, who comes um, out with the best solution that merges these two and provides uh, affordable and responsible credit at the point of sale. Mm. So is that something that's, uh, that uh, Upgrade is uh, thinking about when you're... Uh, it, it's something we're, something we're thinking about, but it, it's, a tough, it's a tough nut to crack. Right. Um, and, but, but I know other, other companies in the space are, are thinking about it as well. Right, right. Okay, so you know, I want to switch gears to you, Sol, and talk about um, you, you know, I'm always fascinated when I, when I think about what you did, and you know, Renaud mentioned it as well, where you, know, you basically, you left, you left Lending Club, a successful company, and you came, you know, it's, it's one thing to leave a company and then to start, to want to start another a company of your own. It's a whole other thing to want to start another company of your own in a, in a country that you, whose language you didn't speak, um, but clearly you saw the, the potential. But I guess, I mean, ha, like how have you been able to overcome the challenges of being a, a, a non-Chinese person and building up an established uh, leader in, China, in Chinese fintech? Well, I wouldn't take all the credit to <laughs> say on my own. I have uh, my co-founder, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I have a wonderful uh, exec team. Uh, I think the world is going global, whether we want it or we don't. You would never ask this question to a Chinese person that moved from China to start a company in the US, and we have a lot of them, very successful people, or from India, or from all parts of the world. I think uh, it's uh, the changes that are happening in China and becoming more open to people like me. I don't think I'm unique. I think probably I'm one of the first ones, but I expect and I encourage people that are thinking about moving to China. It's a, it's a really interesting place. You get to learn uh, a lot about uh, uh, creating infrastructure. You get to learn a lot about things that you did not think, think about. But whatever makes us succeed in Silicon Valley does make us succeed in China and will make us succeed anywhere around the world. Uh, principles like don't tr try to create a problem that does not exist for your company to make sense. Uh, don't try to not focus on the customer and focus on competition. So all these are basic rules that an entrepreneur can, can, can use, whether he's doing it in France or doing it in Brazil or in Germany. So it's really common sense and just focusing on the business. So do you, do you think, on, just on that, do you think we're going to see American companies come over in the, in the fintech space, come over in, uh, into China to try and establish operations? So we have seen a lot of American companies 
and European companies come to China, some of them failed miserably, mm -hmm. and some of them succeeded tremendously. My favorite example, which I keep repeating all the time, look at Starbucks. It's a coffee company that sells coffee in a country that has a history of tea. <laughs> or look at car companies, or look at uh, hotels. So there is a lot of very successful Western businesses in China. The, the fundamental difference between the successful ones and the ones that are not successful, I mean, if you are really serious about China, you have to commit. So don't try to run your business in China when the decision is made in New York or made in LA. You have to commit and you have to have a team that is local that understands. There are a lot of differences between customers in China. There is large population. You have a lot of things that have to be uh, decided and analyzed here. Cannot go back uh, to the US to get uh, uh, a plan from someone who's never been to China and does not connect with, with the realities of, of the country. Right, right. So I think uh, on, on the point of globalization, it's um, uh, applied to, to marketplace lending or online lending specifically. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's been a slow adoption, right? Oh. I think the funding circle uh, has now a good presence in, in several countries in Europe uh, as well as the US. Uh, I think Jan Wong is expanding outside of China. There are a few examples of a few success stories all around the world, but there's no one sort of global online lending platform, um, mostly because of all the things we, we talked about before in terms of, of, sort of different interest rates, different regulations, different consumer behavior um, that uh, make it sort of, uh, impractical or just slow uh, to go through that process, and it's really a country by country analysis of what's going to be the, the best version of the model that's going to work in that particular country. But I think they, when, when we, we look at marketplace lending as a two sided marketplace, um, there's a borrower side, but there's obviously the investor side. I think we'll probably see more globalization faster on the investor side of the platform right. with uh, sort of investors in Asia and Europe investing in US consumers, for example, right. and that, that's already happening. Yeah, and yet, although, although if you look, you know, we were out downtown last night, I mean, S City has a, obviously a, a significant bank in, in the US, and they have a building in downtown Shanghai. So, I mean, the banks have, have you know, have been, um, you know, they, they've been leaders insofar as, you know, they're in you know, Chase, Wells Fargo, these are in many, many countries all around the world. Right. Um, of, sometimes just on the investor side as, right. as well, but it, I mean, I, it seems to me that that's, that's something that, you know, I, I wouldn't say maybe it's inevitable, but the, these, as, the, as the industry matures, should be happening, wouldn't yeah. you think? No, I think? I think it will happen for sure. It's been, again, slow, uh, partially because also some of the largest platforms are either in China and in the US that are such large markets right. that there's no sort of urgent um, reason to go outside of these markets and they, they've, they still haven't saturated these markets right. by any stretch and they, they still all have a small market share in the domestic market. Yep. Uh, but I think over time we'll see, we'll see that expansion and that globalization happening even on the borrower side. Um, my point is it's happening a lot faster on the investor side. Right. So I want to talk about the innovations that are happening right now that we're going to see over the next 12 months. I mean, maybe we'll start with you, Sol, and what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you working on and what do you think we'll see here in the short term in the fintech space in Asia? So there are two sides, uh, two types of customers, lenders and borrowers. I think most of the innovation, the, br the, the real interest in innovation is happening on the borrower side because we are really dropping interest rates from a high uh, uh, numbers to something that is really affordable. So uh, blockchain is serious industry, I mean serious technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, what it allows us to do is unbelievable. So, but uh, w w when I talk about blockchain, I like to focus on the cost saving value of blockchain. <coughs> if you look at uh, uh, finance industry, it's mainly about managing information. I, we just saw what Renault was describing, uh, how important it is for us to make sure that information is reliable, to make sure that our customers receive it and they are confident that it wasn't altered and any of that. We do spend a lot of our budget to make that happen. Blockchain came and gave us a very, very cheap way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we are able to help, like in our example with uh, Foxconn, for example. Uh, 
we are able to open the market to all the small suppliers. And I'm talking about people that want to borrow 100,000 RMB, 500,000 RMB. When you talk about supply chain finance, people usually talk about 100 million. Right. So the reason why banks are not going to those small amounts because the cost was just unbelievably high. Mm -hmm. With blockchain, we are able to help all these small people to get, to get access to capital. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is real. Uh, I think it's gonna be it's gonna continue being adopted, and 12 months is probably uh, enough to see some major breakthroughs in it. Okay. W would you agree with that, Renault? I know you mentioned blockchain in your presentation. You've got that in your company. Are there any, are there any other like key key thing, things that you see happening over the next 12 months? Uh, yeah. So the yeah the use of blockchain is probably going to be uh, more standardized, uh, although it, it might take more than 12 months, and there are because there are also their own issues in terms of transaction cost and, and so on. Um, I think the uh, the use of mobile data and again the the ability to bring uh, responsible credit at the point of sale is something that several platforms are working on, and that's usually a good recipe for something happening. Right. Uh, so uh, that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see, um, but because that's really all coming together now, there's this convergence of um, sort of better geolocation tools that really help us understand where the consumer is located specifically, and, and, and better acceptance from consumers uh, of some push technology that would um, uh, if it has value to them, help uh, lenders present to them an offer or merchants present to them an offer as they, as they walk into the store. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think these, uh, these ideas have been around for some time. Um, we've uh, all thought about it. I think that it's, it's, it's all coming together now. Mm -hmm. So, so you, both of you um, are successful fintech entrepreneurs and I know there's, there's many people in the audience who are at, at various levels of success um, in this space. So what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on so, you know, providing some advice. What advice will you give people who are just starting out in um, how do you grow um, a sustainable business in the fintech space? Ray Lanchi, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> right. I need to memorize my new name. Yeah. Ray Lanchi. <laughs> um, well, I think I've said that before. It's all about the people. Uh, you, I mean, you, to build a great company, you need great people. And, and not just hire great people. Uh, you, you really need to make them work well together and, and develop them and, and make sure they are sort of happy and, and productive in, the work, in the, the work environment that you create. And it's particularly a salient issue with FinTech because FinTech is at the convergence of, well, Fin and Tech. Um, and, and, and you really need both. You really need, uh, great sort of technology-minded people who are very innovative and always want to sort of challenge the status quo and, and wake up in the morning and think, how can we do this better? Um, and, and you need that energy and that innovation, but you also absolutely need um, the, sort of the discipline and the analytical rigor of financial services, because at the end of the day, we deal with people's money and it's a serious business and, uh, and it comes with a lot of responsibility. Um, so ha having this sort of dual DNA and, and making these two type of people work well together, I think is the number one challenge of any uh, FinTech entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So uh, I totally agree with what Renu said. It's really about people. Uh, you need to find people that uh, don't use what's going around them as excuses like all competition from the 80s uh, or uh, the regulators are doing this, are doing that. No, if anything, they are trying to make us even bigger companies because if you believe we are solving a real problem, then we are. So think about uh, solving the problem and think about your solution will be adopted by everyone. Don't focus on small uh, industries. If, if, if you go, uh, leave your well comfortable uh, a job in, in, in a big company and you're going to start from the beginning, you don't want to be wasting your time. And it's really not about money. If you're thinking you're going to become an entrepreneur to become rich, there are easier ways to do it than having to sacrifice five, ten years of your life just to, to, to solve a problem. If you're not excited about it, you need to have that energy to get up in the morning and you need to 
really be honest about what you're doing. Right. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I just want to get this one more question in about regu regulation and the the sort of the tension between encouraging innovation and consumer protection. And I, I, I guess maybe we could start with you, Renault, and just talking about your perspective in the U.S. as far as how those how the U.S. government is doing when it comes to that that balance. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily a tension. I think when uh, when you deliver good products that are fundamentally in the best interest of investors and borrowers, um, you're likely to be sort of compliant with existing regulations and um, only attract sort of good, uh, positive sentiments from, from regulators. Um, we've, we've seen that a lot on the borrower side with the CFPB, uh, so sort of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau that was created about five years ago to protect um, protect uh, financial consumers. Um, the, the Bureau has taken generally a very positive approach towards online lending and marketplace lending uh, because we've put together products that are fundamentally good for consumers and have the number one goal of either expanding access or making credit more affordable and promoting responsible use of credit. So I think, and, and, but, but that's not just compliant, uh, it's, it's also just good business, it's also doing good in the world. Uh, so all these objectives have to come together to create a great industry. And I think FinTech, more than, than any other industry, has really found, I think, that right uh, balance and, and direction and vision of creating fundamentally good product for consumers and investors. Right. Uh, in China is, uh, is a wonderful story. So, for example, when I joined Renault to work on Lending Club, I did not understand why a lot of regulations are the way they are. But here in China, I can see it evolving day after day, and you can understand that uh, uh, for this problem, we have this solution. For this problem, it's all part of building the infrastructure that I was talking about. And it's because of that infrastructure that feeds in into this process of innovation. So you have technology on one side, you have regulators on one side, and you have the adoption from the customers. That's how you create a powerful fintech market in China. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I, I appreciate Renault and Sol coming on and chatting today. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks for that.